I just want to make a comment as well that um, Dixon, the, the chapter in the book, he organises it differently. And um, I just think sometimes about Dixon, he's very, very good on some areas, but sometimes then he chooses to reorganise things just for the sake of reinvention, re either just, I don't know, to be different. And it's that he takes um, characteristics of the interest and organises them across that way, whereas I do it differently. And like it seems kind of at the lower level of the diagram that you'll see that this becomes a bit repetitive, but um, I'd explain why I, I've done it this way, I hope convincingly. But I, <laughs> anyway, so my, my point is that when you're reading the chapter in the book, the organization is going to be or like the organization of the material is going to be slightly different the content is more or less the same so don't worry about it anyway so the freehold commons and they can be positive or negative Now, a covenant, I mean, I mentioned these two when we were doing easements. Um, and easements are rights of way over other people's land. And one of the things that you might remember about easements is that they're generally negative. Like, they're very, very rare easements that you can get your neighbor to do something. Um, and that's almost carried across um, in the case of uh, freehold covenants. It's more or less the same. But the thing about it is that, um, the other thing with easements, it's also quite difficult to get somebody to refrain from doing something on their land because with an easement, what it is is that somebody has got a right to maybe move over your land, but generally not exclusively. So it's kind of more like a right of access. Covenants are when, for example, you might want to preserve your view and you want to make sure that the owner of the plot of land in front of you isn't going to build. It's that sort of scenario. And obviously, the area is fraught with difficulty because how do you enforce that? You might get the original owner to sign a contract, but contracts don't bind. Now, the problem is that, um, that then you could buy a beautiful house by the sea and find you know, a, a 20 story block of flats going up in front of you a month later, and how do you prevent that? So that's kind of the dilemma that um, this area of freehold covenants deals with. So, I mean, I'll be talking to you in a bit more detail about this, but um, the idea of a positive freehold covenant is that you're getting somebody to do something, to expend money, and the law doesn't really like that. And the idea with negative, or actually what are commonly known as restrictive covenants, is that it's getting something to somebody to refrain from doing something. So that's the idea. So then, um, the interest, by the way, is always equitable. A freehold covenant has to be equitable, it can't be legal, and I'll come back to that and the reasons for it in a minute. But they can exist at law or in equity. And do you remember when we did easements? Like, there are two plots generally adjacent to each other. One has got the burden, the other has got the benefit. But well, restrictive covenants arise in the same sort of scenario. I mean, you can't have a restraint to build that's enforceable against yourself. Like, well, I can't see, <laughs> unless we've got, we get into very advanced biotechnology and we start cloning ourselves. But that's, that's outside the scope of this course this year, anyway. We'll see in the future. Um, but you know, that sort of scenario, so you can't sue against yourself. So obviously there have to be two sort of plots of land of some description. So then that means that there has to be a benefit and a burden. And actually, as I've been talking, this is the scary thing about teaching land law. As I've been talking, I just suddenly have realized why Dixon has organized this a bit differently, but all will become clear. I still think that my method is better, but <laughs> I leave you be the judge of that. So at law. You've got a benefit and a burden. Inequity, benefit. 
garden. With negative, actually, sorry, just they're also more commonly known as restrictive covenants. It's the same thing. <laughs> so, positive covenants of law, you've got benefit in a very good inequity, you've got benefit in a very good, then restrictive or negative covenants, the same thing, if they can exist in more inequity, you've got benefit and a very And, um, I hadn't taught this for a few years, so I did. I was doing a bit of reading on it over the last few days, and I kept on kind of waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, oh my God, like, how can you have an equitable interest which is enforceable at law? But it's because there's a contract, and also freehold covenants are between owners of legal interests, okay? Um, that's one thing. Now, the thing that I'm going to also just put in here, but as I say, this will become clear as the lecture goes on. Positive covenants at law, you can have a benefit. You can flip a burden. Positive covenants in equity, and when I say you can have a benefit, sorry, it means the benefit can run. All right? Because the thing about the covenant, like in the early example that I gave, it's all very well to get the person who owns the plot in front of you to promise you that they're not going to build. But what if they assign on their plot a month after you've moved in? Can you bind their successes in title? You know, it's all about that, that sort of idea. Um, as you can imagine, a positive covenant, like which is an obligation to get you to spend money in equity, the burden can't run. Then, as well, like um, negative uh, freehold covenants would be um, requiring the person maybe to refrain from doing something. So not actually spending money. So then the courts tend to be a little bit more sympathetic towards allowing benefits and burdens to run. But at law, the benefit can run, the burden can't, or the negative. And in equity, the benefit can run, and the burden can run as well. Now, what I realized when I was drawing this is that the rationale of the way that Dixon has organized this, I suppose, is that, well, when you don't have these even really mentioned, why bother categorizing it this way, you know? So he sort of organized it differently. He's looked at benefits from positive, negative covenants at law and inequity. So, but anyway, it's just, um, you mightn't like the way I do it, so that's absolutely fine, but I kind of like to take it, you know, bit by bit so that you can tick off things on or not. Now, um, there's one other diagram I want to do as well, and this is just so that I can refer to. So a covenant, basically, first of all, it's a contract between two people. So you've got somebody who suffers the consequence and somebody who, who accumulates the benefit, okay? So as I said again in that example of, you know, getting your neighbor to promise to you or to contract with you not to build on their land, um, you're going to have one person who benefits, the other person who suffers the disadvantage. And then obviously it only becomes problematic when there's a conveyance to see whether the burden can pass, to see whether the benefit can pass, to see who can sue whom in a line of conveyances. So it operates a bit like this. Um, I just want to make sure that you can all see there. So actually, can I do you have a result? <laughs> okay, so you've got A. I'll draw that. <coughs> you've got C, the covenant T. And the covenant T gets the benefit of the covenant. And I put the arrows facing in this direction because the idea is that B is giving a promise, okay? 
So be then the person who bears the burden. So in my example, the person who wouldn't be able to build on their land, so they'd have a restriction put on their land, is the covenant tour. And they bear the burden. And that's all very well if the promise is just between the two. But obviously, land has a habit of getting conveyed. So when I talk about success as entitled, it would be people on this chain, right? And the way in which it would work as well is that, you see, the, if the benefit runs to see, like there's a conveyance from here, and the ownership stays in these hands, then there's generally no problem if the benefit can run. But here immediately you see a problem that if the conveyance goes the opposite way, that A doesn't sell on land, but B sells on the land to D, and the burden isn't running. You see, that's where that can sort of get problematic. So like you can have a conveyance in which you need to inquire whether the benefit is going to run and find success is entitled, but you also have the separate issue of the burden running. And because a lot of this has been developed by case law, the rules that have emerged are different, very conveniently, but it does actually make it quite interesting. And it kind of makes it necessary to to break it down and I think, you know, map it into a diagram as well. Now, um, just one more thing, that uh, when we talk about positive and negative freehold covenants, I'll just put down a, a quick example. So, <coughs> an example of a negative covenant would be a covenant not to build. And an example of a positive covenant would be um, a covenant to erect and maintain fences. So to erect and maintain fences, obviously, it's going to require that you expend money. So the law tends not to be very sympathetic towards those, uh, towards enforcing those. Okay. Now, so the first thing is that um, freehold covenants, they're legally binding between freeholders. Uh, privity of contract exists between the original parties. So as between A and B, if there's a promise to do something or not to do something, generally there's not a problem about that because, you know, the, the principles of freedom of contract, you can enter into a contract. As I said, the problem is that when you're trying to enforce whatever it is against success is entitled. Now, so they're a type of private control of land use, so it's not in the public domain. And this involves landowners seeking to regulate or control how land is used within a particular locality. Okay? And you can contrast it with the public control of land use, and that's actualized to planning departments. Now, freehold covenants, they can be used to restrict development of land, even where planning permission has been granted. So it's an interesting example of where private interests can actually trump public use of land. And they're akin, really, to a form of private planning law. And um, you'll see some of the case laws, like from the 19th century, and it probably goes back a lot earlier than that as well. And it's really, it emerged in a time when there wasn't an awful lot of public control over the use of land. And so people kind of did it for themselves. So the only way in which you could control the way in which you know your locality was going to develop was to try and extract a promise from whoever you bought the land from or whoever you were selling to. So then, in relation to who benefits and who is burdened, the person who makes the covenant and suffers the burden is the covenantor. So that's a bit like, no, it's not like, well, I'd better not compare it to mortgages, actually, because 
it's kind of the opposite of what you think. Um, it's not the person kind of extracting the promise, it's actually the person making it that's the covenantor. And then the person who benefits from the covenant is the covenantee, as you can see here. Um, then in relation to whether they're restrictive or negative or positive, restrictive, negative being the same, uh, most covenants between freeholders, they're restrictive or negative in the sense that they're a promise not to do something on someone's own land, such as building beyond a certain height or carrying on a trade. Like if you're carrying on a business, you might have to, uh, like um, the person who sold the land to you might extract a covenant or a promise from you not to carry on a trade because maybe they want to enjoy their land peaceably or, you know, if you've got a business, it might be attracting people, that sort of thing. And so there'd be a lot more vehicular activity. Uh, positive covenants, such as an obligation to erect and maintain boundary fences, they're very difficult to enforce, as you can see, um, among successors in title, and so they're much less common. But positive covenants are enforceable between the original parties to the covenant, because obviously there you're just talking about a contract, and you can freely enter into a contract. So again, as we've seen in another um, few areas of land, they're like a mixture of the contractual and the proprietary. So the principle of privity of contract binds the parties to the contract, but then you've got to ask the question of what happens when the land is sold? Do the benefits and the burdens of freehold covenants run with the land? Um, just remember as well that they only exist in equity. They are a type of proprietary interest. Now, if you wanted to find out whether an interest could exist at law, or if you weren't sure about it, where would you look? Don't worry, when I was a student, I was too. It's the Law of Property Act, 1925, Section 1. And just kind of, it's, it's useful actually to, um, well, you can access this online. It's useful to go back to it sometimes because it kind of can jog your memory about other areas, of course, that we studied as well, such as, you know, um, some of the major overhauls of, of land law in 1925, where the reduction of the number of legal estates and interests to, for example, um, that you could only have uh, as legal estates, uh, an estate in fee simple absolute in possession or a term of years absolute. So, the, the legal estates were reduced, but then also the interests, the number of legal interests that could be owned were also reduced. And so that's also in section one. And listed are interests such as easements, uh, the charge by way of legal mortgage. So legal mortgages, uh, rent charges, which we've hardly seen, um, rights of entry. So the thing about it is that when you go looking in the Law of Property Act for the definition of what can be held as a legal interest and freehold covenants are not mentioned, then just go down to the next section and they say that, and this is section one, subsection three, all other estates, interests and charges in or over land take effect as equitable interests. Okay. So freehold covenants are by definition. And as I say, it's just interesting sometimes to go back to the, the legislation in question and just, just have a look at what it says. Because, I mean, the other thing, the reason that I mention this is if you're in practice and you're going to see a bit of this, um, if you're ever faced with a difficult scenario and you're trying to bring about some change to the law, going back to um, a particular section of the legislation like that can be very handy because you'll often find a word such as right, and right can be anything. I mean, this is right. So sometimes the courts will actually shut down that avenue, but other times they'll leave it open. And that's how that you, you sort of like, you've got a piece of legislation there from 1925. Um, there are a certain number of sections that are open to exploration. They have been explored and shut down, or they've been explored and stretched. I mean, as we saw with the whole section 62 when we were looking at easements. So it's it's a good idea to, to kind of get into the habit of, of going back to the, the legislation because often people will just do things off the top of their head and they, they'll sort of follow case law but not go back to the original. So it can kind of be handy. Now, um, then section 56 of the Law of Property Act states that a person 
may take an immediate or other interest in land or other property or the benefit of any condition, right or entry, covenant or agreement over respecting land, although he may not be named as a party to the conveyance or other instruments. So that just basically refers to the fact that um, that you don't have to be named in the in instrument to be a beneficiary of the covenant. Now, so there are six matters to consider. Um, the first is that whether the benefit has been passed to successors and parties, and that would be following on any conveyances from A, then was the burden passed to any successors and title, and that would be following on from B, so did they bear the burden <coughs> of the promise? And then you'd have to consider those two questions of common law, and also consider those questions in equity, and you also have to bear in mind that um, yeah, that you have to look at whether you're dealing with positive or negative um, covenants, okay? And just remember that um, when you talk about the running of the burden and benefit of covenants, you also have to have somebody who can actually, um, like ju just supposing that you've got the benefit going on to C and D and that is, that's actually not problematic. But you're going to have to have somebody here against whom you can enforce it. And I think this is one of the reasons why the law has kind of developed a bit differently um, in, in terms of enforcing the benefit and enforcing the burden. Because, as I say, the conveyances mightn't happen at the same time. Like A might convey to C, might convey to E, and there mightn't be any conveyance from the covenant tour, do you see? Or the reverse might happen. So that's why the law has sort of developed like a bit unequally. But anyway, um, as I say, I've, I've done my best to, to break it down, but the rest is kind of just learning, unfortunately. Right, so then first of all, at law, um, positive covenants. So the main case on this is Roman Stevens. And in that case, it's a House of Lords judgment in which it was definitively stated that the burden of positive covenants does not run in law or equity. And positive covenants, again, would be covenants which are requiring um, the covenantor or the bearer of the burden to expend some money. And this often arises actually after flooding, where apparently there are a lot of inquiries. Whenever there's like massive amounts of flooding, there are a lot of inquiries to, to where would you think? If you wanted to find out um, whether your neighbor was liable, whether there was a covenant, or whether you could bind your neighbor to uh, repairing a fence that had been wiped away by flooding. Where would you try and find out? Exactly, that's very good, yeah. Apparently the land registry gets inundated with calls uh, trying to find out about those liabilities, and um, People tend to be very disappointed when the land registry turns around and says, oh, we can't help you, we either don't know, or, well, because I suppose that's actually probably a question that you should go to your solicitor with, but they'd have the documentation and stuff. Um, the land registry would also have the documentation, but they probably don't give out free legal advice. That would be, I, I would imagine that would be the, the rationale behind that. And also, obviously, for, you know, if there's no provision for liability for them giving out wrong advice on a legal matter, you know, um, so, now the other thing is that you might think, well, is this problematic in a setting that isn't rural? And actually, it has arisen a lot in settings um, involving flats for the maintenance of communal areas or contribution towards the upkeep. Um, it's been an absolute nightmare. And the, the, the problem is the law is as it is. So, how do you change this? If the courts have shut down avenues, what's your other recourse? Statute, right? Now, let me see. I'm running for election in 2014 or 2015. And I'm thinking now, what what will I what would make me attractive to the voters? Yes, thing, reform of the law of restrictive covenants. It's not a vote winner. It's not something that people particularly care about. So it sort of tends to be left on the shelf. 
So then, if you were particularly fascinated by this area, because do remember that I said that there's uh, a guy called Gale who made his whole um, career on the law of easements. I mean, he's written this book of easements, and he gets quoted all over the place, all over the world, and in the House of Lords, the Supreme Court, etc., just because he's taken this tiny, well, it's not really a tiny area, but a very specialized area of the law, and just specialized on it. Um, well, that would be one thing you could do. You could make your name from writing a, a book on the law of freehold covenants, right? A practitioner's guide. Um, or alternatively, what, you, what could you do if you didn't want to put that much work into it? What would other avenues for law reform be? Running for parliament. Running for parliament, okay. On a ticket of reforming the law of restrictive covenants or land law reform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but also, you could look for maybe a, a job with the Law Commission because they've recently produced a report on this and there is no activity. So, actually, what you could do is to look at what they've done and maybe run on that ticket. You know, so that is a, a very good idea. Now, the other thing too is. Um, and when I was kind of looking at this, because you kind of start to think, well, if there's benefit here, why do you also need a benefit in equity? Like, if you were suing um, on a positive covenant, would you want to pursue, if you had a legal remedy, would you want to pursue an equitable remedy? Well, the other point that I just want to make about that, I mean, it is logical that you see that the benefit in equity will follow that there's a benefit in law because equity will generally follow the law and equity if anything it's going to be more liberal but if you had a choice that you had the potential enforcement of a positive freehold covenant and you could either pursue a remedy at law or in equity which would you choose and I, I probably would have given the wrong answer to this if I'd answered off the top of my head. And I think that possibly you would pursue the legal remedy. Well, pr presumably, you know, the two would be open because obviously the courts of chancery and um, of common law were fused. So you don't necessarily have that division. And also as well, you know, the equitable remedies of injunction and specific performance. Well, of injunction, sometimes it can be satisfied by the payment of damages instead. So you've got contractual remedies that can be brought in uh, to satisfy or you know, to, to ward off an injunction if the hardship done by granting an injunction would be too much. So like if you were going to be forced to pull down your house, it might be considered to be more just, more equitable, if you like, to actually give the common law remedy at times. Now, the thing about it is, and I, I haven't actually come across, this hasn't jumped out at me before, is that where there's, um, a remedy at law, well, the remedies are damages, obviously, but they're not discretionary. And that's something that we've seen a lot of, actually, in this course, that, you know, when you pursue a trust interest, like if you don't have a legal interest, and then you might be able to sue on a contract. If you don't have a, contract, a contractual interest, but you've made a contribution, you might be able to sue on a trust or other equitable interests like proprietary estoppel. But the problem is they're all discretionary. So with a contractual remedy like this, um, it's not discretionary. So you might actually prefer that. So just um, remember that the burden of a positive covenant doesn't run in law or in equity. And then the benefit of common law can be transmitted. And this is under section 160, sorry, 136 of the Law of Property Act. Um, and the rationale for that is a debt, for example, can be assigned. So if somebody owes you money, um, you can transmit this benefit on. So, for example, if A owed B a thousand pounds, B can sell the debt to an agency um, and they have a right to collect from A. Okay. <coughs> now, but having said that, that success is entitled of the beneficiary, they can only sue the original covenant or as the original covenantor's burdens won't find successes at law. Okay. So now, um, then 
this is one of the, the main cases as well in this area. Um, and in this case, the defendant covenant, covenanted with the freeholders to maintain the banks of a particular river, the Eller Brook. Now, I just want to bring a few things to your attention. So it's River Douglas Catchment Board. That's a public body, so they don't own land. Now, one of the landowners then conveyed the land to P, and this was expressly with the benefit of the covenant. So, sorry, P being the plaintiff, P1 being the plaintiff. And then P1 then leased to the second plaintiff. Then, after flooding, the river burst its bank, and an action was brought both by the first and the second plaintiff. So, in other words, the owner of the freehold and the owner of the lease. And they both received the benefit of the covenant. And the Court of, um, of Appeal upheld this decision clarifying that in order for these benefits to run, first of all, the covenant must touch and concern the land. So that's very like uh, what we saw in easements, that you can't have an easement over somebody else's land that's two miles away from yours. It needs to be relatively proximate. Um, the successor in title must have a legal estate in land, and this can be a lease. And then the land to be benefited must be reasonably identifiable, and also that the parties must intend the benefit to run, uh, must intend the benefit to run with the land. And then, just in relation to the last point, that the parties must intend the benefit to run with the land. Um, this is normally satisfied by the, by the operation of Section 78 of the Law of Property Act, and this states that a covenant relating to any land of the covenantee shall be deemed to be made with the covenantee and his successors in title, and the persons deriving title under him or them, and shall have effect as such successors and other persons were expressed. So even though they're not expressly named, um, it's going to have the effect. So you've got a statutory intervention there to seemingly make that more simple. Is that clear? Yeah? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Now the covenantee must own land, and it doesn't matter whether the covenantor does, okay? Um, and then for the benefit to run, just remember that the covenant can be either positive or negative. And then another case here, um, is that the defendant was a surety for the rent payable by the tenant to the original land landlord. Then the landlord assigned the reversion to the plaintiff. The tenant got into difficulties and couldn't pay the rent. So the plaintiff sued the surety on the contractual guarantee to the original landlord. Now, the question is, had the benefit of the covenant passed to the plaintiff? And the argument was made that the benefit can run at common law, and the House of Lords agreed with this. So this case is authority for that fact. And it didn't matter that the surety didn't own the land. And I was looking back over that, because I've read a number of different books to, to put this together. And that seems to be directly in contradiction, doesn't it? That the government <coughs> must own land in order to be able to ensure that they get the benefit. You see, it, like if we go back a few slides, um, I've said that the covenant team must own land, and it doesn't matter whether the covenant or does. But this is actually slightly different because in this case, what we've got is it's not actually an enforcement of the covenant as such. It's an enforcement of the contractual liability to pay the rent. So in that way, the House of Lords was kind of able to split, I suppose, the benefit as between the contractual and the proprietary. Um, if you're having any difficulties with that, think back to the law of mortgages, which you also have a mix of the contractual and the proprietary, so that you can realize the security of your debt by getting the property back. But if there's a shortfall, so for example, in cases of negative equity, you can also sue on the contract. And it's just that sometimes when you're reading through the books, they just whiz through that. And they did whiz through it because I was there like, how can that be? But anyway, it's because, um, the benefit that you can pursue can either relate to the covenant um, or else also to the contract. And just a reminder again that the burden cannot run at common law. <coughs> so then, in equity. So the remedies in equity are injunctions, 
specific performance, and sometimes damages can also be paid in lieu of an injunction. But just remember, as I've mentioned already, um, that remedies are also discretionary. <coughs> now, burdens don't run with the land of law, but equity takes a different approach. And the law in this area, it's been built around the following case. And the interesting thing is that while Tolkien Mopse is kind of its central case on the running of burdens of restrictive covenants, um, the rationale has kind of been departed from. And I think it's very interesting to see. Sometimes I always get the impression that in these cases where you've got a rationale that doesn't necessarily fit, it's either that the law has changed substantially in the meantime, and 1925 is kind of important here because look back at the date 1843 um, where you know there would have been well the equitable remedies wouldn't have been so restricted um, and land law was less bureaucratized but sometimes as well you've got a case that can establish the law in a particular area but the rationale isn't necessarily being followed so I'll go into that in a bit more detail now so um, Basically, the, the facts of this case are that in 1808, yeah, in 1808, Tulk sold a vacant plot in Leicester Square to Elms, and Elms covenanted, covenanted on behalf of himself, his heirs, and the signs that he'd keep the ground free from buildings. Then there were a number of conveyances. So Moxie came to own the land, and he knew of the covenants, okay? So his land is bearing the burden, but he threatened to build. So if you were told in that position, what would you do? You go to court and seek an injunction. And Tulk successfully got an injunction. But the rationale of the judge was premised on the basis of notice. So and that's kind of interesting because the rationale in the case doesn't rest on the covenant being a type of interest in the land. So rather than granting the injunction on the basis that restrictive covenants bound successes in title, he said no. Well, basically the question is here that Moxie was aware of the covenants but considered himself not to be bound because the law in the area wasn't established. I mean, the law that we've been looking at up to now is from 1925. Look at the date of this case, so that wasn't operative. You couldn't, like, you had no statutory instrument that you could read something into. Um, so I suppose at the time it was more rational for the judges to look at the doctrine of notice. Um, but obviously, the case is still the foundation of this area of the law, but the rationale isn't. And just think back to what we looked at when we saw unregistered land and the problems of the doctrine of notice and the way in which it was reined in uh, significantly. So I think if that case were being decided today and it were favorable to Tulk, Tulk would get the injunction on the basis that there was a proprietary interest in the land which had bound successes in title as opposed to um, being bound under the doctrine of notice because obviously notice has become greatly reduced. Okay. Now, then in relation, just continuing on the burden of restrictive covenants, in Hayward and Brunswick, um, a mortgage, a mortgagee of an assignee wasn't bound by covenant <coughs> to build and keep and repair houses on the land because this would require expenditure. So then a practice emerged that only burdens of restrictive covenants could run with the land. And this has been challenged in Rowan and Stevens uh, in 1994, but the House of Lords held that a covenant to maintain the roof was not binding on a successor entitled to the covenant or so the bearer of the burden. So that's just um, kind of uh, setting in stone, really, that positive covenants are only enforceable against the original covenant or. Now, I also made a small comparison with the law of easements that the law is reluctant to recognize as an easement a right which restricts the use to which the servient donor can put the land. So just remember that easements are like a right to pass over somebody's land, but it doesn't necessarily prevent them from, I don't know, growing flowers there or doing whatever they want with the land, providing that they don't cut off the easement. 
um, and restrictive covenants step into this breach, if you like. <coughs> now, and obviously, again, before the burden of a restrictive covenant will run with the land, there has to be a dominant tenant. And also, the person seeking to enforce the covenant, they have to retain land to be benefited, and that kind of makes sense. As I say, the earlier case which we saw that there was a pursuit of a debt that was actually under the contract, and I suppose arguably those sorts of cases should maybe be left out of you know a discussion of the law in this area, but they're, they're still kind of relevant. So in this case, um, Formby and Barker, Formby had sold all his land subject to various covenants, and the defendant acquired a part of the land with notice of the covenants. And then the administrator of Formby's estate sought an injunction to restrict the building on the land because it was alleged that the building would infringe the covenants. And that argument failed um, because the covenants, uh, or the burden of the covenants, didn't run because the enforcer hadn't actually retained any land. The land had been sold off. So you kind of can't come back at a later point uh, and enforce covenants. I don't actually know why people would do that, actually. Like, if A had sold off all the land, why would they then be seeking to enforce the covenants against B? It would be more logical that the current holder of the land would do so, although some rights are actually retained. I don't know, maybe sometimes that they've got a, a bit too much time on their hands or that there's some kind of agreement between the current holder of the land. You you often wouldn't know what's behind that sort of activity or that they're particularly litigious or that they've sold the land to a friend or something like that. Now, um, and this, the, the issue that the, um, the burden of covenants didn't bind where the enforcer or the person seeking to enforce didn't uh, retain any land. That was confirmed by London um, County Council and Allen. Um, but in this case, the County Council hadn't retained any land as it's been conveyed. But also, County Councils don't necessarily always, um, they're not all like public bodies wouldn't always necessarily own land where they were trying to enforce covenants. So then you, you do have some statutory intervention in that case. Now, um, then in equity, um, for the burden <coughs> of restrictive covenants to run, the covenant must touch and concern the land. Um, the two slots, again, they have to be sufficiently proximate to each other for the dominant land to be benefited. And then parties must also intend for the covenant to run. And the relevant piece of legislation there is section 79. So it's interesting as well for you like at home to just consult this mm -hmm. and just see that um, it says that a covenant relating to any land of a covenantor, so the covenantor, you know immediately there that you're talking about the burden, um, or capable of being bound by him, shall unless a contrary intention is expressed. So in other words, to rule out the running of the burden, you'd have to specifically state it, be deemed uh, to be made by the covenantor on behalf of himself. And then it also adds in his successor's in title and the person's deriving title from under him. So as I say, it's, it's kind of, it's a nice practice to get into, uh, to just consult the legislation. Then, just remember that when we were talking about restrictive covenants, um, when we dealt with the area of registered and unregistered land, and it's kind of relevant to, you know, when, I'm when I was talking there about the changes that the law has brought about to the doctrine of notice, um, well, after Tolkien Matsai, obviously. So in, re in unregistered land, Freehold covenants, they normally have to be registered under the Land Charges Act, okay, because they would generally be sort of seen as a commercial type of interest, and they're specifically listed there. So remember, um, we had a line of cases, Midland Bank and Green, and also Lloyds Bank and Carrick, and those cases established that if your equitable interest was listed in the Land Charges Act, then it had to be registered, and if it wasn't, it didn't find successes in title. But there's a small qualification in the act. Um, it binds, it, it, if you fail to comply with the registration requirements, so in other words, if you've got a restrictive covenant and it's over unregistered land, 
um, it will be listed, most of them will be listed in the Land Charges Act. And if you fail to register it, it won't bind purchasers for money or money's worth. So if you're not a purchaser, but you're a successor in title, so for instance, there are some settlements um, before marriage, you would be bound by that restrictive covenant. Or if you're a squatter, you'll also be bound because squatters are not purchasers, okay? So there are a few exceptions like that to the strict registration rules. Um, and then there are some covenants which were created before 1926, and those covenants would still fall under the doctrine of notice. So we didn't see any examples of those when we were looking um, at unregistered land, but we did see an easement in Ives and High, which Lord Denning said had written on the proprietary estoppel. So it wasn't one of the easements listed in the Land Charges Act that had come into being post-1926. So you'll often have a residual category or a small <coughs> category of certain interests um, that won't have come within the scope of the bureaucratization. Okay? And then in registered land, covenants, they have to be protected by an entry of um, a notice in the charges register. So you know when you're the registered proprietor of um, a particular piece of property, you've got three registers that attach to your property always. You've got the property register which describes the property, the benefits <coughs> of restrictive covenants and the benefits of easements. And then you've got the proprietorship register which will give you, which will give your name, for example, um, any restrictions. And then you've got the charges register which tells any buyer of all the interests that exist that are negative to the property. So the burden of easements, the burden of restricted covenants, etc., etc., will go into the charges register. And they don't, like restricted covenants, cannot be um, an overriding interest or an interest which overrides if they're not um, if they're not registered. So like the the formalities, there's no kind of, there's no fallback posture, basically. So even though you might argue that you've been in possession of the property, that won't save the restrictive covenant. And once the restrictive covenant has lapsed, if you failed to comply with the registration requirements, that's the end of it. It won't be revived on a new conveyance. So in fact, actually, the new conveyors would have to get a, a new set of agreements as amongst themselves. And that might or might not be possible, and it would probably involve somebody having to pay, like the, the beneficiary having to pay a substantial amount of money. Now, um, I'm going to give you a 10 minute break, and then we'll just see the benefits when, uh, of, yeah, of restrictive covenants. Actually, the books don't even deal with this part the benefits of negative, of restrictive covenants that run in law. And I guess it's because equity has become so developed that they just refer to equitable interests. Or maybe it's just that there hasn't been any case law on that. I'm not exactly sure. Any questions? No? OK. Right. <coughs> 10 minutes. Thank <laughs> you.